<laughs> Austin, I'm you from the future, and I've come with a warning. H hello Hi. What's that about? There's no time to explain. You didn't use protection. Did we have a kid? Worse. You didn't protect your internet privacy with ExpressVPN. No! Nah! And that was a mistake. But don't be like me. Sign up for today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is a VPN provider that works to encrypt your internet connection, hide your IP, and protect your private info from others. I use this pretty much all the time, especially for making sure that I'm not vulnerable on unencrypted Wi-Fi, especially on their mobile version. But I'm also using it a fair amount for streaming services who want to region lock their content like Netflix. Let's say I want to watch Terminator 2, but it's not available in the States. Connect to a German IP and bada bing bada boom, we're good to go. If only Sarah Connor had Express ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN doesn't keep data logs of your private info, it's the fastest on the market and it's really simple to use. So if you're looking for a good way to protect your personal information and want three free months with a subscription, click the link down below to get started today. That's ExpressVPN forward slash eruption to get started today. So what's uh, 2021 like? 21? I'm just like a week ahead. Ah, uh, okay. Wait, 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 that's a week? I feel like everyone out there has had that one incident where you or a family member buys a video game based off of a hot licensed property thinking it'll be plenty to keep you entertained. It's a tale as old as time. Being a small and innocent child thinking the world can do you no wrong. Then you play some Jimmy Neutron video game and it's all downhill from there. Before you know it, you're 35 staring at a beautiful sunset after a long week of constant rainfall and it's all you can think about. Uh, here's a video about some of those. We're no strangers to talking about licensed video games on this channel, especially not of the cartoon variety, but I wanted to talk about ones that aren't necessarily restricted to your cartoon networks or Nickelodeons. So yeah, bad cartoon games. We're gonna get started with the oldest of the bunch, Tailspin for the Genesis. As a kid, the Disney afternoon was my jam. Shows like Goof Troop, Darkwing Duck, Chip and Dale, and The Mighty Ducks were pretty unforgettable. Most of these shows from the early 90s lineup would end up getting a video game as well, and because Disney and Capcom were buddy-buddy at the time, most of them were pretty good. Well, at least good enough to get ported as a collection as recently as 2017 with the Disney afternoon collection. However, not all of the games were made by Capcom. And if it wasn't, you could pretty much kiss the Nintendo seal of quality goodbye. Enter Tailspin, a cartoon based on the classic Disney film, The Jungle Book. Except they pull a fanfic AU thing where Mowgli is completely gone and everyone becomes anthropomorphic versions of themselves where Baloo is no longer about the bare necessities and is instead a cargo pilot. Apparently this was just a ploy to bring attention to the Disney Channel after The Jungle Book was re-released from the vault, but I digress, Tailspin. Love this show. I also love the NES game made by Capcom, probably the black sheep of the bunch. So when I got a Sega Genesis and they're like, but you can get Tailspin on the Genesis, I was like, wow, a new game in a franchise that I like, but on objectively more powerful console architecture. I'm in, that's me, four year old me. Then Tailspin on the Genesis is like, It's hard to believe that this was a first-party Sega game released in the same year as Sonic the Hedgehog 2. But it is made by the same dudes who brought us Garfield the Lost Levels, so, uh, yeah. Tail Spin Assist is separated into three types of levels. You've got typical side-scrolling levels, but since we're transporters, the goal here is to collect 10 pieces of cargo before we can exit. So even if you found the exit, tough luck, go back. This feels so awkward to control. Your main method of attacking is a little paddle ball. A, a paddle ball. The enemy hitboxes barely exist, and it's unclear if you're hitting them or not, so your best bet is to just mash away and pray. You get to play as Baloo or Kit, and as you can see on the screen, there's room for two people to play at the same time, but th there's no way that's ever going to happen. After every level, there's a boss fight, but for some reason, no matter where you came from before, it's always the same room. It's like they were having wholesale savings on these prefab evil boss layers. On, and then also, each boss is also basically the same thing. It's just a big, unfun slog. You might be asking yourself where the whole plane part of Tailspin is, and I'm pleased to inform you that it did make it.
I don't think they could have made this any more difficult. Trying to play through this legit felt impossible, but I managed to cheese through it by sitting at the top of the screen and just mashing the button. I guess that is that, that is that legit? The plane sections are really disappointing, and I guess it makes sense considering they didn't have like an entire other fun and charming video game that they could have pulled ideas from. Tailspin for the Sega Genesis. No. Well, that sucked, and it's pretty disappointing knowing that we know exactly what a good game could have been with the same series, but what else do you expect from the 90s? Well, let's jump ahead to 1996. Now, while I might have been a little bit too young for the original incarnation of it, for a while there, Beast Wars Transformers was the coolest thing on the planet. Still is. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. While the CGI looks like textbook examples of what not to do these days, back in the day, this was cool as hell. I've talked about a few Transformers games on this channel before, but there's always been something about Beast Wars in particular that held my attention. I kinda missed the Transformers train, so maybe it was the fact that when Beast Wars was airing, I was six years old, aka the literal prime demographic of what they were looking for. Or maybe it's the fact that it's actually pretty good. Transformers were in a bit of a downswing at the time, so when they came out with this, they swung for the fences. I distinctly remember getting in trouble for spending my parents' grocery money on a sick rat trap toy as a kid instead of buying bread and milk, but hey, maybe don't trust a child. So when it's announced that this brand new multimedia franchise is gonna be getting not just one, but two brand new video games, any kid is bound to get hyped. Except unlike other games where you'd only get to play as the good guys, these ones would allow you to play as both both the Maximals and Predacons. After all, at this time, playing as the bad guy was a cool thing to do. Wikipedia has this feature listed as partially groundbreaking, by the way. So I guess that's like the equivalent of kicking the dirt. Groundbreaking. <laughs> but let's not mention the fact that if I move this slightly to the side, it'll show all of the scores. Whoo! So there's two games, one of which was a blockbuster exclusive Nintendo 64 fighting game called Transformers Beast Wars Trans Metals. That's a terrible name. This also came out on the PlayStation 1, but with way less features, but it's not like it matters because it's just a bad fighting game. What do you want from me? The more interesting game is the one that came out two years earlier, simply called Beast Wars Transformers. Easily the best best cover of a video game I've ever seen, especially this close up of Megatron. Anyways, we're stalling. Let's see the game. Hi, I'm gonna head out. Beasties here falls into that strange category of PlayStation 1 games that everyone seems to forget about. Your tiny tanks and small soldiers, the early third person shooters where you can see the draw distance loading in at all times. These are the games that are exhibit one of why tank controls suck. Unfortunately, much to my dismay as a baby child, Beast Wars in the PlayStation 1 was exactly that, except it's somehow probably the worst it's ever been. Well, I guess it was groundbreaking that you could play as both sides of the con Conflict. I guess nothing really matters when the most important note I wrote down while playing this game was very shit. Every level is basically the same, but it pulls the Fire Emblem thing where you'll lose access to a playable character if they die in battle. Granted, you can rescue them with the best girl air razor, but considering you can die immediately by just trying to understand the geometry, I'm gonna say this one's a pass. It's just a really underwhelming third person shooter. Psst, Beast Machines deserves better. The year's 2005 and you're a game developer. You're like, okay, we got this pretty neat and original video game concept. Uh, let's just find ourselves a hot license to slap it onto. We got like Ben 10, Avatar The Last Airbender, Johnny Test, oh, what? Popeye. Popeye? Popeye. But it's 2005? Popeye. Popeye Rush for Spinach came out for the Game Boy Advance in 2005, and why? Why does this exist? I'm not gonna sit here and discount the popularity of Popeye the Sailor Man, who may or may not have in fact lived in a garbage can, but the existence of this game is extremely baffling to me. Not just for the fact that Popeye was what they used, but also the fact that it's a 2D platforming racing game. <laughs> like, like actually. You pick between Popeye, Olive, Bluto, and Wimpy, and try to outrun your opponents to the right as fast as you can. Uh, and that's the entire game. There's a story mode where they're all like, let's go here, but I'm gonna get there first. And while that's super cool and all, that's all there is to this game. It's like the publisher Namco saw Mad Dash on the Xbox and was like, this, this right here is gold. That game was okay, but Rust for Spinach is not. <laughs> 
this vegetarian propaganda was hot garbage that controlled terribly and for a racing game was really hard to see considering the size of the screen and how big the characters were on it. I, like most people, am not that interested in learning about the high-tech spinach dash canceling, so off with you. Uh, yeah, uh, that's called a, a strike. Speaking of things that are irrelevant, let's talk about Family Guy. I think that a lot of people had a phase where they thought that Family Guy was the pinnacle of comedy. You might find yourself watching compilations of family fat man funny moments or trying to quote some terrible joke to your friends in person. I, for one, knew some people whose entire identity was comprised of Family Guy quotes and that kind of sucked. While the demographic of Family Guy is closer to South Park than it is, say, Popeye the 1920s Sailor Man, they do both share the medium of being a cartoon. Just one is a little edgier than the other. Once people realized that you could turn these adult cartoons into profitable video games, the train started rolling and hasn't really stopped either. From Simpsons to Ugly Americans, Futurama, and of course South Park, you'll see these pop up every now and then. Usually to much dismay. Except stick of truth, you good. But there's none of these that are as awful, offensive, or downright vile as Family Guy Back to the Multiverse. This wasn't that long ago. This entire game is based around an episode where Brian and Stewie travel between universes to do things, but it's mostly just to create set pieces for them to explore. However, instead of creating interesting platforming and level designs, Back to the Multiverse is a collection of shooting arenas, because yes, this is a third person shooter. A rather violent one, too. For a game that tries its hardest to recapture the <clears throat> magic and jokes of Family Guy, I feel like this game only pulls off one. Specifically, haha, dog have gun. And that's where it begins and ends. Everywhere else is just ableist, homophobic, racist, haha, edgy, offensive humor. It's ironic, bro. That's kind of cringe, bro. Which is weird considering early Family Guy is much smarter than that, but okay. It's kind of just evolved into shock stuff like Lois dancing on a table at a frat party saying, I can't have babies anymore, so f You see, it's funny because sex is icky. I like how press start to skip is permanently on every cutscene without me even pressing anything. It's like they knew. Beyond the le problematique stuff, it's just a crappy shooter with bad shooting. Mistake number one, if the only gameplay you have is shooting the whole peanut gallery with guns and throwing dirty diapers at them, then you're not gonna be very good. But what about something a little less edgy? In a weird twist of fate, the existential edgy meme slot was taken up by a show that didn't want to do that, like Family Guy, and was instead taken up by random filler animation frames of SpongeBob SquarePants. You all know the show, but do you know the connection exclusive Spongebob game? I hope not. The Kinect and licensed kids games are a match made in heaven. I've already covered Dragon Ball Z Kinect in the past and we all know how good that was. There's an endless amount of terrible games where you let your body be the sensor and each time I play one I feel like the bottom of the quality barrel gets deeper. Today on Austin vs Motion Controls is Spongebob and oh my god! Decisions, decisions, developers, developers, developers. You know, I don't really know what I expected at this point, but here we are. In surf and skate, you surf or skate, one or the other, down a course in bikini bottom. The concept of gnarly jungle rapids in the middle of the ocean is funny and feels weird, but who am I to question SpongeBob? Well, only when he refuses to move with me anyways, which is constantly, why aren't you moving with me, you sponge f you're supposed to, like, pivot your body left and right to move your board, but subtle motions give a big whoosh left and right, so, I mean, you know how these Kinect games go. At least this one isn't exhausting me like Dragon Ball Z connected with its required air punching. I was, however, able to play an entire level just sitting down on the ground and staring, so that's kind of cool. They did real good. Lesson learned, all Kinect games are bad, except I won't learn that lesson, so see you guys in a couple months with Harry Potter Connect. Probably. All right, I've had it with these safe modern cartoons that everyone on YouTube recognizes. I want to take it back to the past. I want to talk about a game made by the developer of none other than Garfield Lasagna World Tour, Woody Woodpecker Escape from, I can't read, Buzz Buzzard Park. Cursed is an understatement. I'm not too into the fact that this is the second time an ex-Garfield video game developer has appeared in this video, but what can you do? Buzz Buzzard Park is a game based off the Woody Woodpecker reboot, which I never watched because, well, I can't say in good consciousness that I've ever watched anything with this little guy. All I know is that he pecks wood, does the sassy thing, and has that iconic laugh. <laughs> 
<laughs> Yeet hot chip. Would you call this iconic? I don't know. It's certainly no Looney Tunes. But in no time period, dimension, or plane of existence would I assume that there was a fandom dying for a video game based on him. On the surface, it looks like your run-of-the-mill 3D platformer, and well, that's not an incorrect observation. This one just gets tough as nails out of nowhere. You're like, la-di-da, look at this baby game for babies, when suddenly things kill you in one hit, hitboxes seem janky as heck, and you're being shot at with cannons and death lasers from every angle. Hey, y'all remember the episode of Woody Woodpecker where he died 10 times back to back. I don't know, I, I didn't watch it. <laughs> the audio is probably where a majority of the nightmare fuel comes in. Like, they went through the effort of recording a bunch of voiceover audio, but none of it is a language. And there's no subtitles, so it's just a lot of this. And when it's not that, it's this ridiculous floaty, I'm gonna kill your parents sounding kazoo music, blaring over and over in your ears while you peck your way up platforms, riveting. Maybe this shouldn't exist. Stop. Keeping up with the theme of video games based off of cartoons, based off of animated avians that I've never seen, is Sitting Ducks for the PlayStation 2. I'd actually never heard of this one, but when I mentioned it to some friends, they were like, oh, you hit a fuzzy nostalgic spot. And I was like, wow, I'm old. For the rest of you, like myself, who have no idea, Sitting Ducks was a 3D cartoon in the early 2000s about a duck named Bill, some of his duck friends, and a giant alligator named Aldo. It's a strange slice of lifestyle show that didn't do super well in the States, but found itself an audience in Europe. So of course, two years after its initial run on television, it would get a video game on the PlayStation 2, developed by Asobo Studios, the dudes responsible for the brand spanking new Microsoft Flight Simulator and... I gotta feel the tale of two kitties. I didn't mean for this to happen, I swear. This was actually made prior to two kitties, but had a very different mission statement. One was a kid's platformer, the other was a kid's platformer, but with the goal of having the quote, most exploration in a kid's game ever. And uh, considering this predates games like Lego Star Wars, I guess that's true. Sitting Ducks truly was the kid-friendly GTA. Look, you can even drive freely around the city, just with some generic, I'm gonna go buy a sandwich sounding music instead of Tupac Shakur and faith no more. But instead of doing a variety of illegal activity, you just do timed missions where you go from point A to B over and over. Like actually. Besides a racing minigame where Bill decides he wants to be a pro moped er, you're just running around against the clock. And it's real boring. The cutscenes are like fine because they're based off the show. A little unsettling maybe, but the gameplay is like, oh, oh my god. It's not horribly coded or anything, minus a few glitches here and there, like this stuck duck. It's just like nothing. It's, it's nothing gameplay. Maybe a really, really young child might have enjoyed this back in 2004, but all you're doing is learning how to follow a giant arrow on the screen and it turns into a sluggish chore real fast. Except when you get bored. What is it with kids games and vor? Alrighty y'all, I got one more for you and it's a doozy. Now, we've been talking about mostly American stuff, but there's a lot of Canadian cartoons, games, movies, TV shows, just all kinds of stuff that never really makes its way out of the Great North. I've been introduced to so much over the last couple years, but there is one that made its way over here, was a big deal, and I was pretty into as well. Back in the 90s, there was nothing quite like Reboot. And no, I'm not talking about that super hip, cool, new Netflix reboot of Reboot. Christ. I'm talking about Bob. I'm talking about Enzo. And you know I'm talking about the 90s vision of computers and the future. Oh yeah. This episodic kid show was about uh, parts of a computer trying to defend itself from the, the users? It's a little confusing, but it's almost like our main boy Bob here is trying to isekai himself outside of a computer. It's really weird from the get-go, but in a fun and exciting way. Then it got stranger, and then there was a time skip, and well, let's just say it's also got a complicated history that includes the usage of the word monobreast. Yeah. Also, Mouse was dope. I used to watch Reboot all the time when it was airing, and even though things got complicated in the second half, which was left unfinished, it's something that I still think about every so often. But this isn't about the show, this is about the infamous PlayStation 1 video game by Electronic Arts Canada, simply known as Reboot. Holy hell. Ha 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 ha. 
Generally in video games, you want to present a fair challenge to the players. You want whoever is controlling your hero to feel a sense of accomplishment when overcoming levels and bosses. Especially if you're a game based on a franchise for kids, make that a slight incline with difficulty settings so anyone can make it. Reboot for the PlayStation 1? <laughs> Reboot is one of the hardest games I've ever attempted to cover on this channel, and for all of the wrong reasons. It's not that the enemies or bosses are programmed in a way that's challenging. Most of the time, they just kind of sit there. Instead, Reboot's challenge comes from the same sector as Co-op. It's a battle against the controls. It's a battle against the seemingly random physics. The zip board was a really cool thing in the show. It channeled everyone's inner want for a hoverboard at the time, thanks to Back to the Future 2. But making that the only way to move in this game was a mistake. Everyone wanted a cool board, but not like this. Imagine tank controls on ice. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying they should have made Bob run around like a Jack and Daxter character. They could have at least had, like, an ounce of variety. Now, imagine these controls with random level objects tied to time limits. Fail that, you're dead. There's also no continue system, and you have limited lives. You can save, but that means at some point it's very likely that you'll hit a point of no return where you just can't mash your way through the level. It's very unintuitive and punishing for no reason. Not to mention, every time you die, you're greeted with Megabyte taunting you. Even the most die-hard Reboot fans cursed the existence of this one, and it cursed my console as well, considering it just hard froze on me. Nice. You know, for being a game based off of a show where the whole concept is Bob hopping into random video games of all types in order to protect his home, this video game sure is as dry and boring as they could have made it. They could have done anything, but instead they tried to turn Twisted Metal into a platformer. Good job. Well, those sure were video games. I'll catch you guys next week when I cut my hair. Hey, uh, you got any WD-40? Yeah, it's, it's in the closet. Wait, why are you still here? Thank you so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Plasma Phoenix, Nitron, Legend Gary, Kieran Arter, Kevin Zanowski, Josh Garbage Lord, Jordy McCaffrey, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Jeffrey Narvaez, Jay Roos, Imi, Flaming Fighter, Eli Shane Stauffenecker, David Molnar, Donald Dowdy, D.A. Stevens, Cliff Pro, Christopher Olivia, Chris Shelton, and Brandon Howell. Thank you all so much for your generous support. This one took a minute. But we did it! I have a couple of incentive videos I need to get through from the charity stream for the last month and they'll be coming out pretty soon. In fact, we're gonna be seeing a lot of stuff pretty soon this time, I promise. I promise it. We promises. Uh, yeah. Love you, bye.